All right, so today we're going to go over the just review for the chapter five test, the module five <clears throat> test. And the and your test should basically follow this order. Uh, when we started off the uh, module, we talked about vertical line test, horizontal line test. And remember that uh, vertical line tests, they test for functions. For vertical line tests, they test for functions. And then horizontal line test, they test for inverses or one-to-one, -one. right? So we take a look at the first problem. It says use a horizontal and vertical line test to determine if the graph is a one-to-one -one function. So I can't actually write on this on the screen, but if you first apply the vertical line test, that would determine if it's a function. If it's a function, then you're going to use a horizontal line test to see if it's one or one or not. But if it's not a function, you wouldn't even check the horizontal line test. So if I were to draw a vertical line test or a vertical line, Notice that there are going to be two points of intersection. So this thing is going to fail a vertical line test. So this is not a function. Okay, because you got more than one point of intersection. Okay, for number two, it says determine whether the function is one to one. So in this particular instance, they're giving us the fact that y is equal to x minus 1 is a function. We have to determine whether it's 1 to 1. So if you take a look at the actual setup, y is equal to the absolute value of 1 minus x. That's actually a V-shaped graph. Can we talk about transformations of graphs? So I am going to, I'm just going to graph this one in a calculator so we can see what the function looks like. But just from knowing about our functions, this should take on some type of V-shaped graph. So if I were to put in absolute value, so if you're using a calculator, absolute value is, is within the math key. I'm going to scroll over the number. Okay, ABS is that first option. All right, so I'm going to go over the number, ABS. And you don't actually see the vertical bars. They give you parentheses, which allude to the vertical bars. I'm going to put in X minus 1. Okay, and I'm on the graph. All right, so notice that we have a V-shaped graph. If we were to apply the horizontal line test, and that's going to determine whether it's one to one, notice that that's going to fail a horizontal line test. So for number two, this function is not one to one. Okay, it is a function, right? Because it passes the vertical line test, but it fails a horizontal line test. Okay, and this is actually problem number three, and it got kind of cut off the screen. Let me see if I can fix that. All right, it says for the following function, for the following exercise, find f inverse of x for the function f of x is equal to x divided by x plus h. So 
So here we're asked to find the inverse. So we're given f of x is equal to x divided by x plus 8. All right, so remember the steps to write out an inverse. Uh, and then the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just rewrite everything in terms of x and y's. So the first thing I'm going to do is let f of x equal to y. So I'm going to rewrite this as y is equal to x divided by x plus 8. The second thing I'm going to do is interchange x and y. So that means wherever I see a y, I'm going to interchange it with x. And everywhere I see an x, I'm going to interchange it with y. So now this is going to be written as x is equal to y divided by y plus 8. And the third and last thing to do is to solve for y. All right, so now here is the key to the whole thing on solving for y. Notice that on the right-hand side, there are two y variables. Our goal is to get the y variables on the side of the equation by themselves. Then once you're on the side of the equation by themselves, factor out a y and then solve for y. So the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of the fraction. So I'm going to multiply both sides by y minus, excuse me, by y plus 8. So I'm going to multiply the left-hand side by y plus 8. I'm going to multiply the left hand, the right hand side by y plus 8. So whatever you do to one side, you must do the same thing to the other side. On the right hand side, I'm going to distribute x. So I have x, y plus 8x. On the right-hand side, the y plus h are going to cancel, and I'm left with y. All right. So now I have x, y plus x on the left-hand side, and I have y on the right-hand side. So my goal from this point is to get both of the y variables on one side, and to put the 8x on the other side. So I'm going to subtract y from both sides. And I'm going to subtract 8x from both sides. Is everybody okay with what I just did? Like from here, I transpose y, so I moved it to the other side and I changed the sign. And I transpose 8x, so I moved 8x to the other side and I just simply changed the sign. I did like do two steps in a one. So notice now I have both y terms on one side of the equation. So my next step is to factor out y. So if I factor out y, I'm gonna left, I'm gonna be left with y minus x minus one on the inside of the equation. And I'm gonna be left with negative eight x on the right hand side. All right, so now the last thing to do is to solve for y. So I'm going to divide both sides by x minus 1. So y is equal to negative 8x divided by x minus 1. And now the very last step is to rewrite y as f inverse x.
right? Because this Y is not an actual Y. It's an X in disguise because we interchange X and Y. So the last step is to rewrite Y as the inverse. All right, so any questions about number three? All right, number four. It says evaluate the function around your answer to four decimal places if necessary. Uh, for this problem, I would use a calculator. All right, we're given f of x is equal to negative 2 raised to the power of 3x plus 1, and we want to find f of negative 3. All right, so there's a, a couple of ways to do it. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is just use substitution, this sto that's in the calculator. So I'm going to take the value for x, negative 3, and I'm going to store that for x. Right. So the calculator is going to automatically substitute negative 3 for x. Storing a value for x, it doesn't affect your graph or anything. Okay, There's always a number stored for x, whether you're storing it or not. So now I'm going to enter in this function, negative 2 raised to, okay, and since I have more than one term for the exponent, I'm going to use a set of parentheses, raised to the 3x plus 1. All right, so our calculator behind the scenes is substituting x for negative 3. All right, and if we hit enter, we get negative 0 0.0039. Another way you can do that same problem without using the store key is you could just simply just put in your calculator. Negative 2, we're going to raise that. And notice I'm still using a set of parentheses. You can get one of those. That's the reason. Okay, I'm going to raise that to the 3 times negative 3, and I have to put that in a set of parentheses, plus 1, right, and you should get the same value. All right, that's number 4. All right, number five says rewrite the equation in exponential form. That's the log base five of 134 is equal to X. And if I go back to what we did yesterday or Monday, This is the actual formula to rewrite a logarithm as an exponential. So if we're asked to write and this is number five, the log base five of 134 is equal to x. If you have to write that as an exponential, right, the base of our log, which is 5, that's going to equal to the base of our exponent. Since this log is set equal to x, x is going to be 
the exponent for five and we're going to set that equal to the argument of log, which is 134. All right, so rewriting log base 5 of 134 is equal to x as an exponential would be 5 raised to the power of x equal to 134. All right. Um, any questions about number five? All right, number six says expand the logarithm as much as possible. Rewrite as a sum or difference of logs, and it says to preserve the order. And here we have the log base B of 7 over 13, and we're asked to expand that out. And I believe this is on the same note. Okay. All right, well, I'm not going to search through all of these, but. All right, well, we had the properties of logarithms. So I'm going to go back into our course. I'm going to go to formulas. And I believe there is a formula sheet that has. Here it is. Okay, the properties of logarithms. Okay, and again, this is in our Blackboard homepage under formulas. Okay, and this can be used for the test. So that very first property is the product rule, and it says that you can rewrite a product as a sum. The second rule, which is applicable to our problem, is a quotient rule you can write a quotient as a difference so this is the rule we're going to use to expand out that quotient so notice when you're using this quotient rule the numerator becomes the first log minus and whatever in the denominator becomes that second logarithm after the minus So for this problem, log base B of 7 over 13, that should equal to, and this is number 6, log base b of 7 over 13 that should equal to log base b of 7 minus log base b of 13. Okay. so just a matter of in this case recognizing which property to use all right problem number seven it says expand the logarithm as much as possible. Rewrite the sum, rewrite as a sum, difference, or product of logarithms. Preserve the order from left to right. So this is number seven. The 
natural log of a to the six times b to the fourth over c to the fifth. Okay. And just one thing to point out, these properties for logarithms are also the same as the properties of natural logs. So first off, if you look at the quotient, anything that's in the denominator is a minus. Anything that's in the numerator can be separated out as sums. All right. So I'm going to write this as the natural log of a to the 6 plus the natural log of b to the 4th. minus the natural log of c to the fifth. I'm also going to use the power rule for this. So these first two terms, the natural log of a to the six plus the natural log of b to the six, I use the product rule to rewrite that product as a sum. The C to the fifth that's in the denominator, since it's in the denominator, it's minus the natural log of C to the fifth. So I use the product rule and the quotient rule. Next, I'm going to use the power rule. So if you look at number three, this third property of logarithms, it says that the log base B of X raised to the power of Y, if we have a power on our argument for the log, we can rewrite that power as a multiplier. So notice how this y as an exponent, it gets treated as a multiplier and is moved in front of that logarithm. So I'm going to apply that for all three of these terms. So this first term becomes 6 times the natural log of a. The second term becomes 4 times the natural log of six. That third term becomes negative five times the natural log of C. And this is our solution. So we've expanded it out as much as possible and we use the power rule. All right, any questions about that? Because this actually like builds up to solving it. All right, problem number eight, it says to condense the expression into a single logarithm. So here we're going to use those properties all again. So we have 2 times the log of x plus 3 times the log of x minus 1. And we're asked to write that out as a single log. So this is number 8. Express as a single logarithm. So that's 2 log x plus 3 log x 
plus three log x minus one. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is the reverse of what we did for the previous problem, right? We took the previous problem and we expanded the log out as much as possible. And in this problem number eight, we're trying to rewrite as a single log. So if we look at number seven, the first thing we did was we used the power rule. Or the last thing we did was use a power rule. So when we rewrite as a single log, the first thing I'm going to do is use the power rule. So this multiplier of 2, it becomes an exponent for x. And 3 becomes an exponent for the log of x minus 1. So I'm doing everything in reverse. So what I ended with writing everything out, I'm going to start with when you have to make a single term. So the first thing I'm going to do is use the power rule. And I'm just going to go down. So this is log of x squared plus the log of x minus 1 cubed. Right, and that's the power rule. We can treat those multipliers as exponents. Next, I'm going to use a product rule. Right, because the product rule says that we can rewrite a sum as a product. So I'm going to rewrite this as the log of x squared times x minus 1 quantity cubed and this is our solution so you don't have to actually multiply all of that stuff out okay they want you to leave it in a factor form okay so when you have to write as a single log use the power rule first if it's applicable to the problem okay, and then use the product and or the quotient rules all right that is number eight number nine says use a horizontal line test to determine which of the following graphs are one to one And I don't think it's going to let me put all of this on one page. So we'll take one at a time. So a horizontal line test determines if the graphs are one-to-one -one functions. So I can't actually write on this. But if you take the first graph, and if you were to draw a horizontal line, there's no more than one point of intersection. So this is one-to-one. -one. If I take the second graph and if I apply the horizontal line test, it's going to fail because there's more than one point of intersection. Right. So A would be an answer choice. And B is not an answer choice because it fails. And if we look at C. C would also pass because if I were to draw a horizontal line test, there's only one point of intersection, so this is one. All right, so the answers here would be A and C.
Okay, 10 says evaluate the expression of four decimal places using a calculator. So that's E squared. So once again, on this calculator, E is above the natural log key. All right, so E squared is 7.389. And I'm assuming everybody has a graphing calculator. But if not, this is just a calculator from Windows. And you have a couple of options when you first open it up, it may look like this. But if we go up to the top right hand corner, you can change this to scientific. And as far as this class is concerned, you can do some of the things with it, but not a whole lot. But there is an exponential E. So I guess to evaluate E squared on this calculator, first change it to scientific. You have to put in your power and then hit that exponent, exponential E key. All right, number 11 says to evaluate the function round to the nearest four decimal places. So this is similar to, I believe, problem number four. All right, I'm just going to use the store feature on the calculator. I'm going to take the value negative one, store that for X. And then I'm going to just put in the function negative five raised to the power of three X plus one. And we get negative 0 0.04. Uh, problem number 12 says sketch the graph. Two times three to the power of X. And basically what I would do for this problem is I would graph it in the graphing calculator. Okay, and I'm going to put it in exactly how it, as I see it, 3. And then instead of parentheses, I'm going to put in a 3, and I'm going to raise that to the power of x, and I'm going to graph. All right, I'm going to get that graph. The next thing I'm going to do is go into table. And I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's right above graph. So I'm going to go in the second in table. And I would pick these two points. Zero comma zero comma two. And one comma six, which means I would find that exponential function and I would just make sure that these two points are on the graph. 0, 2, and 1, 6. Right. Number 13, I don't, I don't believe we did one like this in class. It says, suppose an invest, investment account is open with an initial deposit of $15,000, earning 8.7% interest. Round your answer to the nearest dollar. How much will be in the account? How much will the account be worth after 30 years if it's compounded monthly? So I'm going to go back to this formula sheet. And here is the compound interest formulas. 
So this first formula you see, it says it's compound interest formula. A is equal to P. And I'm going to explain all what these things mean. P times 1 plus R over N raised to the power of NT. And then we have continuous compounding formula, which is A is equal to P times E raised to the RT. So whenever you're asked for or continuous compounding, you use that second formula. So if I'm looking at A and B, right? If you look at the latter part of B, it says if it's compounded continuously. So for B, I'm going to use the second formula. For A, I'm going to use this first formula. So this is compound interest. Okay, A is equal to P times 1 plus R over N raised to the N times T. So P is equal to the principal. And the principal is the amount of money you invest or the amount of money you borrow. Because this works both ways. R is the interest rate. Okay, and the interest rate is set by the bank. N is the number of compoundings. Per year. So if it says annually, um, N is going to equal to 1. If it's monthly, oh, I need to write the word annually. Annually, N is equal to 1. Monthly. N is equal to 12, and then like so on and so forth. And then quarterly, N is equal to 4. Right. And then T is the time in years. So for number 13, all right, I'm just going to rewrite this out, this is number 13A. Oh, and I'm sorry. A, that's the amount in the account after T years. All right, because all those variables mean something. All right, so we're asked how much will be in the, in the account or how much it'll be worth after 30 years, we're actually finding or solving for A. So how much will the account be worth after 30 years? So that's our T if compounded monthly. All 
right? So we have the initial deposit, which is P, that's $15,000. We have the interest rate, which is 8.7%. But when you use your percentages and calculations, you must convert the percent to a decimal. So I'm going to drop the percent symbol and move the decimal two places to the left. So 8.7% as a decimal is 0 0.087. N is going to be 12 because it's compounded monthly. And T is going to be 30. Right. So we're just going to put all of that into this formula. So that's going to equal to 15,000 times 1 plus 0 0.087 divided by 12 raised to the 12 times 30. And I'm going to simplify this up a little bit. So this is 15,000 Oops. So I'm going to take Point zero eight seven divide that by twelve. I'm going to add one if I multiply twelve times thirty. That's 360. And I'm just going to put this in the calculator. So this is 15,000. 1.00725 raised to 360. And we should have 20. No, 200. 2,000. 74 dollars and nine cents. I'm looking at the answer key and it looks like they rounded to the nearest dollar. Yeah, it says round all answers to the nearest dollar. So this would be $202,074. All right, so that was a 13B. It says, how much will the account be worth after 30 years if it's compounded continuously? So going back to that formula sheet, A is equal to P times E raised to the RT because we're compounding continuously. So A is equal to P times E to the RT. So the principal once again is $15,000. 
the rate is 0 0.087 and the time is 30 years. All right, so I don't even need n for this formula. So this is $15,000 times at exponential e raised to the r times t, so that's 0 0.087 times 30. And I'm just going to enter all of that in in the calculator. So this is 15,000 um, times exponential e raised to the 0 0.087 times 30. And we have 200, 3,986 dollars. All right, so any questions about 13, A or B, because we did not do those in class. And here again, the formulas are found on the Blackboard homepage under Module 5, under Formulas, and under Formulas under Module 5. But I guess I could print some of these. Okay, so I'll just let those crane and then after class, I'll go get them. All right, that was number 13. Number 14 says, use like basis property and exponents to solve the equation. So we have 10x is equal to 10,000. And this is number 14. And it's basically solved. 10 raised to the power of x is equal to 10,000. Right? So you can make both of these a base 10, I believe. So I'm going to put like method 1 right here. So if I make both of these a, a base 10, so this is 10 raised to the power of x, and 10 raised to the fourth power would be 10,000. Since I have like bases, I can drop my bases and set my exponents equal, and x is equal to 4. And here is method number 2. Uh, 10 raised to the power of x is equal to 10,000. And this is the method we looked at. If you can't make both bases the same, you could take the natural log of both sides. So taking the natural log of both sides, that's like the most powerful thing. Even if you can make like bases, it'll work. If you can't make like bases, it'll work. So I can take the natural log of both sides. I can use power rule, so I can rewrite x as a multiplier. I can solve for x, so I can I can divide both sides by the natural log of 10. And x is going to still equal to 4. Okay, if you take the natural log of 10,000, divide that by the natural log of 10. You're going to get 4. All right, so that was method number 2. Okay, but in the direction, it just says to 
use the like basis property. All right, number 15 wants us to rewrite the exponential in log form. Uh, we have 5 raised to the power of y is equal to x. And we want to rewrite it as a logarithm. And this was number 15. So this is going to write that all to x in the conversion in reverse. So we have a raised to the power of y equal to x. This is the and a long form and And then whatever your exponential is equal to, that is your argument. So I'm just going to apply that same process here. So I'm going to start with my log. The base of the exponent is 5. Therefore, the base of the log is 5. That's going to be set equal to whatever our exponent is, which is y. And our argument is x. So we have log base 5 of x is equal to y. All right, number 16. It says expand the logarithm as much as possible, write as a sum, difference, or product of logs, and preserve the order. All right, so here we have the log of 5 times x times y. So we're going to use a product rule. And for every product, we can change to a sum. So this is the log of 5 times x times y. So I'm going to write this as the log of 5 plus the log of x plus the log of y. Okay, I don't have to use any power rules. I'm simply rewriting every product as a sum. All right, that was number 16. Number 17 says find the domain. Find the domain for y is equal to log of 6 minus 2x. y is equal to the log of 6 minus 2x. To find the domain, set the argument 
of the log to greater than zero and solve. So the argument is like whatever's inside of these set of parentheses. So my argument is six minus two X. So I'm gonna take six minus two X and set that to greater than zero and solve it. The reason why you set it to greater than zero is because of the exponential form. When we were dealing with exponents, the base had to be positive. So when you rewrite a log as an exponent, that means that base has to be positive. So we set the argument to greater than zero. All right, so now I'm just gonna solve it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is subtract six from both sides. I'm gonna divide both sides by negative two. I'm going to subtract 6 from both sides. Divide both sides by negative 2. And this is just a rule. Whenever you multiply or divide and inequality by a negative number you must reverse the signs so notice my inequality flip from greater than to a less than and that's because i divided both sides by negative two. However, it wants the answer in interval notation. So I'm just gonna draw a rough sketch of X is less than three. So I'm gonna draw a number line. I'm gonna center it at three. X is less than three. So at three, I'm gonna draw a parenthesis Right, and that line is going to extend to the left. So notice on my number line, I have negative infinity to the left most, positive infinity to the right most. So my domain is negative infinity to three. Right, that is number 17. Okay, number 18 wants us to solve the logarithm a two. I mean log base two of seven x plus four is equal to two. We're asked to solve that logarithm. So that's log base two of seven X plus four is equal to two. So the first thing I'm gonna do is change this log into an exponential and then solve the exponential. So converting this to an exponential, the base of the log is two. So that means the base of the exponent is two. I'm gonna raise two to the second power and I'm gonna set that equal to seven X plus four. All right, so we have converted the log to an exponential. So now I'm just going to simplify
So now I'm going to simplify the exponential. So 2 squared is 4. That's equal to 7x plus 4. So now it's just a linear equation. So I'm going to subtract 4 from both sides, divide by 7, and x should equal to 0. So number 18 should be 0. Number 19... It says solve the equation given below, give the exact answer separated by commas using fractions and radicals if necessary. All right, so we want to solve. base 3 of x plus 7 plus log base 3 of x plus 5 is equal to 1. So in order to solve this logarithm, first thing we got to do is combine the logarithm into one single log. Then once we have one single log, we convert it the single log to an exponent and then solve the exponent. So I'm going to combine these first two using the product rule. So this is the log base 3 of x plus 7 times x plus 5 is equal to 1. So now I'm actually going to multiply x plus 7 times x plus 5. And I'm going to do that over here. x plus 7 times x plus 5. All right, so x times x is x squared. x times 5 is 5x. And then I'm going to distribute 7. So 7 times x is 7x. 7 times 5 is 35. So I get x squared plus 12x plus 35. So I'm going to rewrite this as the log base 3 of x squared plus 12x plus 35 is equal to 1. So I use a product rule to rewrite everything as a single log. And then when we had the single log, I just multiply those together. So now that I have a single log, I'm going to convert this log to an exponent. So the base of my log is 3. That means the base of my exponent is 3. That's raised to the first power, right, because that's set equal to 1. And that equals to x squared plus 12x plus 35. So now we have a quadratic equation. So in order to solve a quadratic equation, we want to put the quadratic equation in standard form. That means to make it equal 0. So I'm going to subtract 3 from both sides. So we have x squared plus 12x plus 32 is equal to 0. So I just subtracted 3 from both sides. And now I'm going to factor. Okay. 
since the last term is positive, both numbers are going to have the same sign as a middle term. So both of my numbers are going to be positive. I'm going to use the product sum. So the product of those two numbers should equal to 32. The sum should equal to 12. So the two numbers I'm going to use are 8 and 4. Right, eight times four is thirty-two. Eight plus four is twelve. So we're going to factor x squared plus twelve x plus thirty-two as x plus eight times x plus four. I'm going to use the zero factor property. So we have x is equal to negative 8 and x is equal to negative 4. But you want to make sure that when you substitute your numbers, into your log form, that you don't get anything negative. So here's what I mean by that. If I take this first solution, negative 8, and if I go back to my original question, right, if I were to plug in a negative 8 for x here, notice I'm going to get a negative 1. And if I put a negative 8 here, notice I'm going to get a negative 3. We can't have any negative arguments so negative 8 is not a solution. If I check negative 4, I'm going to go back to our original problem. If I substitute x for negative 4, negative 4 plus 7 is 3, so I get some positive. If I substitute x for negative 4 here, negative 4 plus 5 is positive 1. So our only solution is negative 4. All right. So just to review that problem, we combine logs to make a single log using the product rule. Then we multiplied x plus 7 times x plus 5. We then converted the logarithm to an exponent. We saw that once it was simplified, it was a quadratic equation. So we set it equal, we set it equal to zero. We solved it by factoring. And the last step was to check the solution. Okay, and we wanted to avoid negative arguments. So that was number 19. And the last one, number 20. It says solve the equation. Solve for x in the equation below. It says do not convert your answer to a decimal. Okay. So this is number 20. So that's 2 raised to the power of x minus 22 is equal to 52. Two. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is isolate the exponential. So I'm going to add 22 to both sides. So I have 2 raised to the power of x is equal to 72. I 
and I'm looking at the answer. Well, that's 74. I'm sorry. 22 plus 52 is 74. And from this point, I'm going to take the natural log of both sides. I'm going to take the natural log of 2 raised to the power of x divided by natural 74. I'm going to use the power rule on the left hand side. So I'm going to rewrite that exponent as a multiplier. And lastly, I'm going to divide by the natural log of 2. So we have the natural log of 74 divided by the natural log of 2. Okay, so they will accept both of these answers. Just let me show you that they're both correct. So here we have the natural log of 74 divided by the natural log of 2. Right, which right, which is six point two oh nine. On the answer key, they're using logs, but the final answer is the same the log of seventy four divided by the log of two. Right, and we get the exact same answer. So if you were to put in the log of 74, or excuse me, the natural log of 74 divided by the natural log of 2, that solution would still be correct. All right, so any questions about module 5? Uh, let's see. Hopefully this recording.